Hey, weirdos, I'm Ash. And I'm Elena. And this is Morbid. This is Morbid. How are you? I'm good. I'm looking at snacking cheeses. Snacking cheeses? Yes. I recommend, I think they're like... Oh, fuck. Are they? They're like the Bella Romano or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And they have the Merlot ones. Belgioso? Yes. Not Gio- Bella at all. Gioioso? Something yeah. like that. I apologize. I am only 1.4% Italian. I'm not any percent Italian, so no apologies <laughs> for me. Um, They have a Merlot one that's really good. Yeah. An espresso one, which sounds odd, but is good. Sounds and then good to me. They have a champagne one that I tried Champagne-y. recently. And these are all cheeses, by the way. Really good. 10 out of 10 recommend. We love us. Send us cheese. Sponsor us cheese. Oh, I love cheese. (laughs) Yeah, get the little uh, little snacking ones for the gals. And there's Mm. an Asiago one that's just chef's kiss. Chef's kiss. Yeah. If I'm going to do a a snacking cheese at like a Baby Bell Mm. or I forget what the brand is. It starts with an S. It's called like... Maybe it's like Supreme Bites or like Super Bites, but it's little mini brie cheeses. Ooh, I could take brie or leave brie. That's upsetting. I I would never leave brie in a million years. I might leave it if it hurt my feelings. It could hurt my feelings, but I would still (laughs) stay. I would still stay. This has been cheese with With Elena and Elena. I love it. I like that we both put each other first. I was just going to say. I like that was sweet of us. That was nice of us. I like that a lot. I like that. All right. Well, I have a case today. You're like, I don't know how to segue into this. I don't know how to segue because this is a really really sad one and it's a really confusing one. I'm going to go ahead and tell you at the top of this that nobody's really ever convicted for one of the deaths that we're going to talk about. Oh. And it's very unclear whether it's simply a death or uh, more complicatedly a murder. Wow. Yes. So we're going to be talking about... Joan Robinson Hill and John Hill. Okay. But we're going to start with Joan. So Joan Olive Robinson, she was said to be born on February 6th, 1931. I say said to be because her birth certificate was like lost at some point actually. Oh. And there's no record of her birth that exists as far as anybody knows. Wow. But as far as people do know, she was born to anonymous parents in rural Eagle Lake, Texas. And a month after she was born, she was given up for adoption to Edna Gle- uh, to the Edna Glaney home in Fort Worth, Texas, where she was actually quickly adopted, which like, yay. Oh, and she her. was adopted by Davis Ash Robinson. Hey. He was known as Ash and his, and his wife, Rhea. Aww. Now, Ash Robinson, he was a classic Texas oil man. I feel like oil men are like a running theme in my cases yeah lately. i'm loving an oil tycoon you these days. love an oil tycoon or like maybe not but maybe not but you are interested Precisely. in their stories it's because rich and i love oil tycoon. A rich oil story you love a dallas kind of story oh yes you know? yes yeah. very like whoa very whoa very exactly. flashy very <gasps> very shocking <laughs> very that adjectives so, those are them. <laughs> so Ash Robinson, he was a classic Texas oil man. He wore a wide-brimmed cowboy hat all the time. He drove a Lincoln Continental. Yeah. And he was uh, deeply suspicious of liberals, we'll say. Okay. Yep. As a child of the old South, he had views that were mm, increasingly out of step with the world around him. That were interesting. Yeah. But despite his hard exterior, he absolutely adored his wife and his new daughter. Well, that's good. Yeah. That's he, all we can ask. He loved his family. I don't know if I really want to know anything else about his personal views, but I, he loved his family. And honestly, the most important part, you love your family, you're taking care of them, that's good. Yeah. Treat them nice. Exactly. And this was kind of during a time where most dads were, you know, pretty hands off and left yeah. the baby's needs mostly to the mother or the woman in their life. But Ash was not about that life. He insisted on tending to the new baby's needs, preparing her formula, changing diapers. When she was old enough to take on trips, he would bring little Joan around with him to check on his oil wells at the time. Oh, man. Which was like a very rare sight. That's really cute. Yeah. And as she grew, there was nothing Ash would not do or give to his daughter. Do for or give to his daughter. Author Thomas Thompson wrote... 
Should a minor scratch appear on her arm, Ash would summon a specialist and, if necessary, a medical staff. Oh. Like, he he loved his daughter. Yeah, she was, she the was apple just like eye. precious cargo. Very much so. Love that. When Joan was four years old, her father hired a chauffeur, a chauffeur, quote, chiefly because he enjoyed going on rides with his daughter and did not want to divide, divide his attention between her and the road. Wow, that's really precious. That's some dad shit right that's there. That's some oil tycoon <laughs> shit right there. I was going to say, that's not just like typical dad shit. That's <laughs> yeah, oil that's tycoon. Like, that's really rich dad shit, but like very adorable. Yeah, it's kind of like hot girl shit adjacent. Yeah, there you go. Now, it was on one of those drives that Joan got her first glimpse of the animal that would play a very, very important role in her future. Ash would later recall, I remember well exactly what happened. As the car passed a field full of horses, Joni commenced to hollering that she wanted to ride those ponies. <laughs> that was the beginning. Everything dates from that afternoon. Oh, wow. She fell in love with horses she and horseback riding. became a horse riding. gal. At just four years old, where... You know, that's an age where, like, a lot of kids would be pretty intimidated by a giant fucking horse. For sure. And, you know, just, like, straight up scared. Not Joan. She became completely obsessed. Within a few weeks, Ash had purchased her an older horse that she learned to ride on and, of course, learned the responsibilities of owning an animal in general. Yeah. Within a year, so when she was five years old, she was riding in competitions and winning ribbons alongside riders riders that were twice her age or Damn. older. Damn. Good like, for her. She was an incredible, incredible horseback rider. She loved rider. it. As she entered high school, that love of horses was continually rivaled only by the love of her father. And when she graduated and enrolled at Stevens College in Boone County, Ash and Rhea Robinson actually leased a suite of rooms at a hotel across the street from the campus so that they wouldn't have to be apart from their daughter. Wow. Which, you know... I think that it's lovely that they loved their daughter so much. Well, it was out of love, obviously. It was out of love, but I definitely think it was a little overboard. Yeah, you need, I mean, you do need to... I, I mean, I can't imagine because my kids are so young that I'm like, I can't fathom being apart from them for any length of time. Like, you gotta let them spread their wings. But I know at some point you gotta let them, like, be a little independent, but that's tough. Yeah. And at least you know it was out of love. <laughs> and I think it's you so know? different, too. Like, I think there's the added level that she was adopted and yeah. like they wanted the, to have a baby so badly and yeah. like did whatever they could so to maybe have it was just baby. like yeah it was just out of an abundance of love and protective nature definitely you know now at college joan was instantly popular with her peers and her instructors and she also maintained her passion for riding and she spent most of her free time when she wasn't at classes or anything at the stables but at the same time she also was keeping up with her grades she was doing really well in school trying to satisfy her parents. And while she may have loved her mother and father, she definitely did, their constant presence eventually did become stifling. Yeah. And, of course, you can imagine she's at college. Like, she yeah. wants to branch out a little bit. One of her friends later said, most of us felt sorry for her. She was completely under her parents' thumb. She couldn't even accept a date without checking with them first. With all that attention, she was hungry for love from somebody other than Ma and Pa. Oh. Uh, I know. That's the thing. It can backfire. That's exactly. But it's never intentional. You know what I mean? Like it's always, you can understand it. No. And I really, I really don't think it came from anywhere other than a place of just love. Really loving like, that child. <laughs> real, real yeah. raw love. Yeah. It's sad. Now, when she was younger, you know, in her childhood years, the love and attention that she got from her parents, specifically her father, helped Joan grow into like a confident, empowered young woman. But as an adult, that same adoration had become a little more oppressive and smothering at this point. Yeah. While she was still in college, she appeared in a drama department production, which sparked an interest in acting that actually led her all the way to Hollywood to take a screen test. Hollywood. But Hollywood. And that, that's kind of what her father said. He said Hollywood. He said Hollywood. But a little different. Because when he found out about her intentions to make a name for herself in acting, he was not pleased. Oh. He immediately refused to allow this, and he told her, I quote, too many good girls had been destroyed by show business. I mean, show business is not a is a scary place. It so is. You can you can see the you can see the hesitance that you would have to allow your child, your only child, hundred percent to enter that. I get that, but like, and especially again, during this time, like that's and that's the other thing. This is a very different time. I, I mean, any time really sucks. Any time entering show business is like intense, but this was but like that's, a. It was like frowned yeah. upon at this point in yeah. time. Yeah, and it, and it looked it's looked at very different at yeah. that time. So it's like, yeah, and, and but it sucks for her because it's like it's what she wants to do. No matter what, you want your parents to like support your dreams. Of you know? course, absolutely. But it's a tough. 
It's a tough little double-edged sword there. It is. I, I do get to a degree where, where Ash was coming from, but I, I get also his, understand. I get his worry. Yes, and I also understand why Joan would be disappointed. Yeah, you can see both sides there for sure. And I think as much of him, as much of him that wanted her to not become an actress, it also had a lot to do with the distance that would have been oh, for between sure. them. I That's think the thing. That was also a big part of it. That's a, This is why this is one of those things that it's like you're not seeing these like you know, shitty parents who are just no. hard asses to for the sake of being hard asses. You know what I mean? That just like put all these crazy unnecessary expectations on this child and have like driven her to it just seems like it's like you can kind of understand both sides of this coin here, which yeah. makes it so sad. It's a lot. Yeah, because you're like, I get it. Yeah. I get both of you. I get I get yeah. all of it. Yeah. You seem like you just all love each other and want to make each other happy and it's difficult for that to happen. Yeah. But over time, it would become clear that Ash Robinson's influence over his daughter's life extended well beyond professional and financial. While she was still in college, Joan met and fell in love with a man named Spike. Shut up. Spike Benton. Shut I immediately up. thought of you. Spike Shout out to the rewatchers. Is this William the Bloody? It's not. No. It's just Spike Benton. It's just Spike. It's just Spike. <laughs> uh, he was a young man from a pretty prominent New Orleans family. So oh. like both of your... Your interest. Oh my goodness. There. Uh, he, yeah, he's from a pretty prominent New Orleans family, and he had recently graduated from the United States Military Academy. Oh, wow. Look so, this guy. They met, they fell in love. Eventually, the relationship, you know, turned serious because love. Because love. Because love. And Spike approached Ash for his permission to marry Joan. He's like, I love your daughter. I really, I really want to marry her. That's adorable. Uh, Ash was like, no. Oh. And no, <laughs> not happening. That, that's not adorable. He was like, you guys are too young. I really don't want Joan to marry you while you're an active member of the military. And I also think it's going to be way too expensive for you guys to keep up with the horses. So, no. <laughs> I mean, he just tacks that on. He's just like, horses that. are expensive as well. So. He's like, mm, sorry, she's a really good rider. Uh, you're in the military, so you're going to move around a lot, which uh, I'm not going to let that happen. It, that must be so hard. It must be so hard. I dread this kind of stuff because yeah. it's like you have to let go. Yeah. And you have to relinquish a little bit of control. But you with don't your know kids. how because you've never done it. But you've spent their whole life doing nothing but trying to keep them safe and, and protect steer them. them the right directions and teach them things and like make sure they're okay. And it's like, and then you just have to release all of it and hope and that hope whatever you, you did, did it all right. Right. So it's like, I, I can't imagine how much, but it's like, but the you more gotta. you fight for control as they get over, I, older, I just like from what I've witnessed, it feels like it just backfires. There, and it must be such a hard, like, balance to yeah. strike, you know? Because that's the thing. You hope that, like you just said, you hope that you gave them enough that they're going to make yeah. good decisions. And you also hope that, you know, like, you loved them enough and created, like, a bond with them where if they're not doing okay, they'll come to you. It, that and you have to, to have faith it. in that. Exactly. Like, and I think that but it's tough. is where letting go could become a little easier if you have that bond where you know that they'll still come to you. Exactly. And, and I don't know if Ash even really thought about that yeah i think he was just blinded by like i can't let this yeah happen. it was just blind fear of like this she's gonna leave exactly yeah and for that reason <laughs> literally any reason he could possibly think of for them not to get married he named and Ugh. used in his argument against this idea but despite his refusal jo uh, joan insisted that she wanted to marry spike and eventually her father did relent and oh, okay. he gave his blessing but it took it took some it took time. a little bit yes <laughs> Now, after the wedding, Joan and Spike moved down to Florida, where Spike had been stationed, actually. And just as they had done when she left for college, Ash and Rhea Robinson also found a reason to relocate to Florida. Huh. And they rented an apartment just a few miles away from the newlyweds. Guys, I love you. But you, you got to give them a little space. <laughs> this is bringing helicopter parent to another Yeah, level. it's like, I, lo I get... I I, I see that you have pure intentions here. You right. You love your kid. Right. But like, you got to give her a little space. Because the thing was, rather than being a source of support for the young couple, Ash became a constant presence in their lives. He started every single morning by going to have coffee at his daughter's house, which is really precious and but so lovely. But like, if this, there's got to be a little division. Here. Yeah. Like if my, you know, my grandpa came to my house every single day for coffee, like right now when I had just gotten married, I'd be like, I love you so much and you can, you can totally do this, but this is a lot. But like we need a little separate. And that's the thing. If it was just coffee 
every morning. That would and that be was one their thing. thing, and they decided that was their thing, and that was it. And otherwise, they had very like regular average time together you know like that's one thing but it's like because there's so much other i'm sure it became a little stifling yeah a little like domineering unintentionally no it wasn't long before the you know the stifling constancy of ash robinson became a point of contention for spike and joan in the marriage Eek. and unfortunately within six months the marriage completely fell apart oh boy and joan it sent her back uh to texas with her parents all three of them oh, relocated no. back to texas uh, luckily for Joan, it wasn't long before she fell in love again, this time with a New Orleans lawyer named Cecil Burgess. She's loving New Orleans here. She does. And she's also just like gorgeous. So you can see why. Yeah. She, um, she's not having any trouble. Now, Cecil and Joan there, they both really shared a love of horses and riding the horses and they really bonded over that. And before long, the prospect of marriage was raised yet again. But this time, Ash just flat out refused to allow his daughter to, quote, run from the ruins of one marriage and into another. Ooh. Yeah, that's that was All a right. read right there. We're starting to overstep a little. <laughs> a little bit. A little, <laughs> a little bit. bit. In fact, he not only refused to give his blessing to this specific marriage, but he, quote, unquote, forbid it. Oh. Which, like, okay. Okay. And he's he's pushing Joan at this point. Yeah, I, uh, forbidding your child to do something, especially when they are uh, not a like child. older, is really just a recipe for them doing it immediately. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Because regardless of her father's feelings, Joan and Cecil ended up eloping in 1949, and they just got married by a justice of the peace without oh like, anybody there. Yeah, of course. But unfortunately, this marriage didn't really last long either, and within six months, Joan actually just ended up leaving Cecil and filed oh. for divorce shortly after. At the time, the Robinsons told friends and family that Cecil had been a good man, but that he had a gambling problem Ah. that had ultimately ruined the marriage. But the truth was actually that Joan's parents had lied to her about Ash having a heart attack in order to lure her back to Texas. And once she was there, Ash had successfully convinced Joan to leave her husband by offering to buy her a new car, mink coats, new horses, and telling her that, um, he needed her more than Cecil did. Big yikes to that. Um, so he didn't see. I, I don't know if Cecil had a gambling problem and maybe that was just like a, a fragment of the truth or if he really didn't at all. And it was just that, you know, I they, they, no matter what, they lured her back there by saying that Ash had a heart attack. That's fucked up. And he did not. I'm just going to be honest with you. That's fucked up. Yeah. See, the we've, thing is. We've crossed a very large boundary. This the boundary is, is so big. This is dysfunctional at this, this point. This is so, this is toxic. This yes. is not okay. Nothing I've been trying. I I've know. been trying to be like, you know, parents love their kids. It's hard. You know, shit. Wow. Okay. You just love being near her. But you're right. Coffee's nice every morning. <laughs> but no. We crossed no, over. That I gave a big, wide, wide boundary. And they just, they just galloped right over it. Like a horse. Like a horse. Like a horse. Yeah. Now, by 1951, when she was just 20 years old, Joan had graduated from college and was twice married and twice divorced. So she was still living at home with her parents at this point. She was really completely free of responsibility, but she was ambitious and eager to leave some kind of mark on the world. So she started competing in horse riding tournaments again around Texas and the southern part of the country. And over the next 20 years, she would actually go on to win, quote, over 500 trophies and two of her horses won several top awards in the 50s and 60s. Damn. So she she was really... She was really talented. really good. (laughs) Yeah. And she really wanted... To have, she wanted to make some kind of name for herself, like in some professional endeavor, and she she set that she, goal for herself say, and succeeded. She very much succeeded, and she couldn't have picked a better time to be unattached and un, uh, unattached and unencumbered because by the late 1950s and early 60s, the oil boom in and around Texas made countless men into millionaires. Oh, just millionaires, millionaires coming out of the woodwork, Dallas, <laughs> Dallas millionaires, and this whole movement really transformed the city in, into kind of like a playground for the elite and the newly wealthy. It's, it's Dallas. It's I'm Dallas. telling you. <laughs> and as a member of the old guard, Joan Robinson was at the center of Houston's uh, high society. She was old money. She was old money. She was beautiful. She could have had whoever the hell she wanted. Wow, she was look at Joan dining at the finest restaurant. She was being photographed everywhere because she's 
pretty much a socialite, I would say. She was getting photographed at the opera, at nightclubs, freaking cafes even. And according to Thompson, quote, uh, the author, there were weeks when Joan's name and photograph appeared six or eight times in the papers. Always she seemed to be flying off to a horse show or winging in from Hollywood where people ogled her at the, uh, I think it's the the Mocambo? Mocam- it's Mocambo? a nightclub. I looked up how to pronounce it and Mocambo? it's like a place, Mocambo? but then it's also like a nightclub. I think uh, it's the Mo- Mocambo. Yeah, I like it. I don't know. I've never been there. I haven't either. It's uh, It doesn't exist anymore. Her life sounds pretty fun yeah fancy I love free it. like the shit you read about in like good books yeah just like so you know what sounds great for her love it now despite all the trouble her father's overbearing presence had caused joan always made a point to share her life with her parents no matter what turmoil and tension there had been she did love her parents and she yeah. loved her dad years later after her joan's death her mother Rhea would tell a reporter i often felt the only real love in my life was joan every time i went out with my daughter i had a wonderful time Aww. she made me feel loved she made me feel wanted which oh, that, breaks that like my heart. really breaks my heart that like like ash wasn't like a real love for her you know yeah and it's like damn and it's- i i wonder if because they didn't necessarily have that with each other in their marriage that they they loved Joan to kind of make up they for that. They had so much extra love to and shower her with. Not in like a marital way yeah. or anything like that. But just yeah. it was like a different kind of love that they Yeah. That they really devoted that, their well, lives to. Well that's the to. thing. It's like as I mean as twisted as that love got at the end with like that lying about a heart attack and all that, like that's yeah. fucked up. But like but you know even that was done out of, I think, desperation Big and time. like because of a love that is a little different than a we toxic. can comprehend. Yeah. But yeah, it's like that's this just feels like I don't know. They needed family therapy. They did. I think. But this was like the 50s. They would have benefited so. from it. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't gonna happen then. It was but, not gonna happen. But now I'd be like, just you know, sit down with some people. Yeah, back then they were like, do cocaine about it. Yeah, just you know, that's fine. <laughs> it'll it'll intensify everything. Yeah, everything will be great. No, they they were not doing cocaine. I'm not saying that. No. I'm just like lolling. It was just in the 50s. But meanwhile, Ash continued to be a dominant presence in Joan's life. He was finding ways to drive off any potential suitors before any real relationship could begin. One former boyfriend, Travers Fell, recalled meeting Ash for the first time, and he said, I could see the hate in his eyes. That old bastard le- le- leaned on me every way he could. I got the impression that Joan wanted to get away from her father, but she loved, but she both loved him and feared him. Eek. Yeah. Now, as exciting as Houston nightlife was, by 1957, Joan had grown really tired of the casual dates that were not really going anywhere. And a future of jet setting and horse shows just wasn't as exciting as it once had been. It was great, but it wasn't everything she wanted. Yeah. Now, one afternoon in the spring while attending a horse show, she ran into a man named Dr. Riley Foster. He was a family friend and actually one of the city's most well-respected surgeons. And he was in the company of a young man that he introduced as Dr. John Hill. Joan was immediately drawn to this drawn to this Dr. John Hill. Dr. John? Mm-hmm. He was a very good looking guy in, in Joan's eyes. He had an earnest personality. So later that afternoon, Joan called Riley Foster's wife Maggie and insisted that they set her up with John Hill as soon as they could. She was mm. really into it. Look at her. Now She's little, going after what she wants. She is. She's that's that Joan is a go-getter. She is. She is. Now let's talk a little bit about John Hill. Let's go. Let's do it. He was born 1931, and he'd been raised in uh, the Rio Grande Valley, which is a section of Texas wedged between Mexico and the Gulf. His parents, Raymond and Myra Hill, had what one person described as a, quote, business-like marriage. Huh. Yeah. Based more on sustainability and practicality than on love or romance. Not what I'm personally looking for. Yeah. John was right in the middle of the three kids, and he, uh, he was said to be the most dominant and energetic of the Hill children. He was known mostly for his curiosity and penchant for taking things apart to see how they worked, how everything functioned. Okay. Growing up, he and his brother Julian were, they had a really, really close bond. They were almost inseparable. And that actually surprised some people because of their polar opposite personalities, which immediately reminded me of us. Yes, absolutely. Because all the time people are like, you guys are really close, but like, like you're completely though? different people. <laughs> it's like, it works. And it just works. And they developed a deep love for music that they bonded over between the two of them. Oh. And that would 
really kind of, they would maintain that love for the rest of their lives. And it was a huge part of their relationship. I love that. Now that passion that they shared came handy, uh, came in handy at church where Myra was a strict follower of the doctrine and raised her children to do likewise. She was a very devoutly religious woman. Okay. Now, it was actually her idea for John to become a doctor. She constantly reminded him, quote, there are 10 doctors in my family, and I'd be so proud if my two sons became the 11th and 12th. Whoa. Lots of pressure. I was just going to say no pressure, though. Yeah. Even despite a pronounced defiant streak in his personality, though, John did make his mother's dream come true when he came home uh, for Christmas break during his sophomore year in college, and he announced that he did want to attend medical school. Look at John. I know. He was like, hey, mom, good news. I'm about to be number 10. Number 10. Number 10. By the time he moved to Houston for his medical residency, John had decided that there were too many heart surgeons in the area. A a common problem. Yeah. Fuck that. And he was like, let me pursue plastic surgery because there's a lack of plastic surgeons in this region. And I could also become hella rich. I was just going to say, and it definitely doesn't hurt to paycheck. He was like, let's do it. Now, while some of John's friends and family remember him as a quiet, unassuming young doctor, there was also definitely a streak of arrogance and recklessness about him that people remember that occasionally caused problems. Yeah. Yeah. In one incident early on in his medical career, he performed surgery on an older person who was suffering alcoholism. And um, this surgery was basically, he was performing it in order to drain excess fluid from the man's stomach. Mm -hmm. I guess the procedure is a relatively common, simple one, but there is a risk of puncturing the bowel, which can cause a obviously massive infection. You don't want to do that. And that is precisely what happened. Whether he realized that he had hit the poop pipe yeah for lack of a better term whether he realized he did that or not is unknown but when he finished the surgery john simply sewed up the patient and walked away oh and days later the man developed uh peritonitis yeah Yeah. peritonitis sorry peritonitis Mm -hmm. and ended up dying e now when john was called before the senior surgeon at the hospital he flatly denied having perforated the bowel But said, if it did happen, it was so minor that it didn't need a repair when it did happen. Honey, you can't perforate the bowel. You just can't. Like, even minorly. (laughs) Like, you can't do that. Yeah. The surgeon that he had to talk to later said, that guy had a million defenses, but he was so charming and so eager that I didn't want to wreck his career over one mistake. One mistake? It caused somebody's life. Yeah. I don't know if I would call that, like, a mistake. Eek. Yeah. But anyway... All right. To friends, Joan and John, when they did get together, because they did, they made a bit of an unlikely pair. To Maggie Foster, the woman who had set them up at Joan's request, the relationship actually seemed doomed to fail, in her opinion. <laughs> okay. She, she was like, I didn't really want to set them up, like but I Joan set insisted. Them up, but set them up to knock them down. She was like, I, was, I didn't have any plans to do that until Joan called me and yeah. asked me to. Maggie said she knows horses and nightclubs and where Pa keeps his checkbook. Hmm. John Hill knows how to play the trombone and make sutures. He's a mama's boy who winces every time Joan says, God damn, which is often. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie, which is often. Serving <laughs> the tea. She's like, mm. <laughs> like, Joan says, God damn a lot. She's like, Joan says, God damn a lot. John doesn't like it. He's a mama's boy. Fuck them both. I like the, like, Whoa, and she's Maggie. like a daddy's girl. He's a mama's boy. It's like, ee. yeah, it's, it's yeah. not great. But Joan and John, they did hit it off, like I said. She was taken by his charm and welcomed the opportunity to share her luxurious world with somebody who still found Houston society exciting, which I think in turn made it exciting for her again. Yeah, because she's been here the whole time. She's just been living this life. Yeah, and it was kind of getting dull because I think she was lonely. But now through someone else's eyes, it's like, oh, this is pretty luxurious. Right, exactly. Now, more importantly, though, for one reason or another... Ash Robinson didn't lose his mind at the idea of Joan and John dating. Huh. This was the first time this had happened. In fact, when Joan brought John to meet her father and ask for his permission to get married, Ash was more than hospitable and even took an interest in John and his career. Maybe he saw his daughter with a doctor. Maybe he just looked at this as a respectable career, the most respectable. I think so. I definitely think so. And he's going to make a lot of money. And he is setting himself up for a life in texas not exactly else. yeah so they're staying here he's got a lot of money they're part he's of gonna they're gonna be, be part of this social circle part of high society he's a doctor right yeah mm-hmm. i get it 
And years later, Thompson speculated, it must have occurred to Ash Robinson that the alliance was on balance, one that he could live with. Yeah. Joan was 26 years old, and if she had to marry somebody, then John Hill was not the worst of choices. That's the thing. It doesn't seem like, you know, he's like a bad guy, so... No. I, I don't know anything about this case, so I am just spew spew. I don't know that he is a bad guy, maybe I'll, maybe I'll regret saying that, but right now, I get why Ash was like, you yeah. know, this looks fine. I will tell you on early paper. on that I think you're going to go on the same roller coaster that I did. I hate with, roller coasters, so with John. let's go. I don't, I still don't know how I feel about John one way or the other. And this sounds so weird. Because we're talking about John. And I'm I like, oh, I think John's great. <laughs> You're like, take your earrings out. Let's fight. I'm like, yeah. We're not getting on a roller coaster. John will get vertigo. Okay. So. That'd be bad. <laughs> John Hill, I should say. Yeah. Now, so Ash didn't say no. Yeah, so John, he was fine with it. John and Joan married in September of 1957. And they had a, a ceremony held in her parents' huge backyard. It was gorgeous. Sure, it was gorgeous. Gorgeous. The next day, the society pages and all the local papers described the wedding in storybook terms, like one outlet that reported the bridge aglow in an elegant white lace. Or the bridge. I was the like, bride. I think it was bride. <laughs> I think it's his bride. The bride aglow in an elegant white lace gown. Ooh. After the honeymoon, the couple accepted Ash's invitation to live with them at his estate. Damn. Noting that it would help them financially while neglecting to mention that it would also give Ash the opportunity to keep a close eye on his daughter and new son I was going to say, I mean, that was definitely the reason. He was like, wow, you could just live in my house. It'll save you so much yeah. money. For John, though, who had just begun his residency, living with Ash and Rhea Robinson was a godsend. Yeah. At the time, surgical residents were only paid $165 a month. Damn. Crazy. While, like, breaking their backs to yeah. go through a residency. Exactly. It was barely anything considering yeah. the work week that could range anywhere from 60 to yeah. 80 hours. Damn. And so the arrangement made it so that the couple not only saved on rent, but also benefited from meals and food and, you know, electricity yeah. and all the things that Ray you have to pay Ash. for. Coming to the rescue. Exactly. And in addition to all of that, as members of Houston society, most social events and other entertainment were paid for by Joan's parents. Yeah. So they got to live this lifestyle. Yeah. And... Not have to not like, pay for it. Rub two pennies together. Right. Without the crushing financial stress that most medical students experience, John and Joan were able to enjoy the early days of their marriage. Yeah. But John's frequent appearances in the society pages was a constant irritant to the ethics com uh, committee at the hospital. Oh. And they believed having a surgical resident among all that nightlife was ethically questionable. And they actually insisted that he cease his celebrity nightlife appearances if he was going to continue his residency. I, I can see that. Yeah. I don't want to know that my that. doctor's out all night at a nightclub. I don't like, want to know anything about my doctor. Yeah. Just that like he's nice to me when I'm I there. I like my doctor. Say I love my doctor. He does a good job. Yeah. That's all I want to know about him. I, I don't, don't want to open up him. a tabloid and see him like, you know, hanging out with... Whoever at Just some like nightclub. Downing Crystal. Like, yeah, I'm I don't want to see that. I'm good. Like, do it. All by all means. Yeah, go. I don't give a shit what you're doing, quietly. doctor. But like Dodge the photos. Yeah. Like Dr. Jeffrey, it's fine. Like, just do your thing. Yeah. Exactly. Don't don't tell me about it. So yeah, I get I it. They're like, we don't need you showing everybody what you're doing all exactly. the time. And the ethics committee, they weren't the only thing that put distance between John and Joan Hill because they did since John had to ease up yeah. on these appearances. Joan's schedule was usually really, really busy and required her to travel most days out of the week. And John really hardly ever went with her. Even when he could, he didn't really. Oh, uh, the not result, making an effort. No. The result of these circumstances was that they pretty much began living separate social lives. John focused on his career and his music, because remember, he's really passionate oh, about yeah. music, and Joan on her horses and competitions. But neither at this point seemed resentful or jealous of the other. All right. So it worked So they just them. have their own things and And it whatever. worked for a bit. Yeah. In June of 1960, Joan actually ended up giving birth to a boy that the couple named Robert Ashton Hill. Ah. And they nicknamed him, or uh, excuse me, I should say Ash, his grandfather, nicknamed him Boot. Boot? Yeah, that's hilarious. I'm not sure what that little was about. Boot, little boot. <laughs> that's adorable. Little boot. Hey, little boot. Little boot boot. <laughs> I think I it's adorable. That. I love it. I, it I just, don't. It makes me laugh because it's so cute. 
I don't know if that was like a Texas thing. Like he I'm wore sure, little boots. Yeah. Like, oh, look at the little boot. Look at this little boot. A little cowboy boot. <laughs> but the pregnancy and the birth had been actually difficult for Joan. And for John, the baby was the first sign of major changes in his life that he had been enjoying. Oh, you mean she created a whole human in her body and now things have to be a little different? Yeah. Oh, okay. And, Distracting. you know, like she is dealing with the after effects of uh, creating and delivering human yes. life. Yes. Yeah. It's a little tough. It's a big thing. Uh, for one thing, as we all know, children are expensive. They sure and are. Time consuming. Very much so. And John being in his final year of residency meant that they would need to continue relying heavily on Ash and Rhea, Joan's parents, for financial and practicable uh, practical support. Practicable support. Practicable <laughs> support. For Ash Robinson, though, the birth of his grandson could not have been a more Aww. celebratory event. He fucking loved that boy. Oh, that just like I'm like. He just wants to like I don't I don't know. He just loves kids. I don't know. He this loves his family. Of mixed feelings here. I know it's it's but a I'm lot. like he really does love his family. It's he does kind of sweet. He said, well, he loves most of his family. Yeah. He said of his son in law's apprehension about, you know, becoming a father. I don't care if he's ready or not. We're very happy. <laughs> He's like, I don't give a fuck about him. I don't give a fuck about that guy. I'm happy. Yeah, he's like, I'm psyched. I'm a grandpa. I got a little boot now. (laughs) I'm grandpa fucking Ash. And this is my little boot. (laughs) Like, shut up. That's so cute. (laughs) That's hilarious. But of course, just as he had done with his own daughter, Ash adored Boot and wasted no time lavishing him with gifts and attention. And it's really sweet. They were really close for a long time. And John and Joan, they managed to survive the distance between them caused by their different interests and their social lives. They kept up appearances for their neighbors and the society pages. But I think becoming parents and, you know, for for John specifically, the baby and more specifically Ash's adoration of the baby brought about new opportunities for criticism in the Robinson Hill household yeah. that was going to test the strength of their marriage. Yeah. By 1963, Ash had become more vocally dismissive of John, telling friends that John contributed nothing to the household, seemed to have no trouble spending his own money on a piano or other musical interests, but, like, not providing at all for his kid. Eh. Once at a party, Ash was overheard telling another guest, here comes the famous plastic surgeon John Hill, who never even bought his son a jar of baby food. Ooh. (sighs) Ooh. Can you imagine being a party yeah. goer like uh, uh, having that conversation and you're just like damn and like john is like right over john hill yeah is right over there and you're in between that like the Eek. tension within yeah. that moment i'd be like and that's like go. a that's like a, a mic drop boom oh like, yeah that's like he's not even buying his kid baby food and it's right. like eek yikes that's, that's not a good look my friend that is not a good look yeah and the thing was in the world of houston's elite john was checking all the right boxes as he was climbing up the social ladder but as long as he lived in his father-in-law's house, he was never going to be considered no. to be truly successful. In fact, when his colleague, Dr. Nathan Roth, offered him a position at his private practice, it came with the stipulation that John move himself and his family out of the Robinsons' house Whoa. and into his own home. Uh, John was obviously very happy to accept this offer because tensions had gone past a point of... Being uh, manageable. At being this point. any kind of manageable. Yeah. And the $5,000 personal loan Roth was giving him uh, was a nice, a nice asset. Yeah, that helps. So while the opportunity to establish himself in private practice was incredibly exciting, there was still the matter of Ash Robinson, or more specifically, how John was going to tell Ash Robinson that not only would he no longer need his financial support, but that he would be moving away with the two most important people in the man's life. Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, not surprisingly, Ash responded poorly to the news. Not shocked. Joan insisted that it was for the best and that the house that they found for their little family was only a few miles away. So it wasn't like they so that's bad. wouldn't be able to yeah. still see each other every day. Regardless, John had made up his mind. And in 1963, the family moved to their own home about 10 minutes away from the Robinsons. Oh, so okay. not bad. Yeah. At the same time, John eagerly joined Roth's uh, surgical practice as a junior partner, anticipating a really bright future. Unfortunately, though, the Hills would have or would not have much time to celebrate the positive developments in their lives because just a few weeks after the move, this is really sad, John's brother Julian was found dead in the attic of a family friend's <gasps> home. He, uh, there was an empty bottle of barbiturates beside him. Oh, geez. Now, nobody really knew why he had ended his life, 
But there was a predominant theory that Julian had struggled with anxiety and depression for a long time and that he may have been living his life as a closeted gay man. Oh, that's so sad. So he had like a lot on him. Yeah. And the bleak future that he envisioned for himself because he lives in Texas in the in the 60s, 60s at this, at this point, point, very yeah. early 60s, that had just become too much for him to bear. Yeah. But because this happened right as they were starting to kind of you know, get out on their own. Yeah. It set them back big time because That's a lot they were best with. friends, John and Julian. That's sad. Yeah. And it was the first tragedy that they really went through as a couple. Yeah. But unfortunately, it was just the beginning of a downward It'll spiral. It'll test you. Yeah. And they would experience a lot more tragedy. In the years that followed Julian's death and the start of John's professional career, Joan and John continued to drift slowly but steadily apart. After joining the practice, John, he really threw himself fully into building a name for himself at the practice and among the social circles. He acquired or achieved pretty much all the hallmarks of a successful surgeon. And when he wasn't occupied with work, John enthusiastically pursued his musical interests, which left little time for his wife or his son. John, uh, Joan often was pretty upset and lamented that John hardly knew their son and never really made any attempt to engage in the typical father-son activities like camping or sports or literally anything anything at all. That's shitty. It is. Like, and to, to not make an effort. And that's the thing. Her her complaints about this lack of a relationship were not baseless. Because it's like, I get that you're trying to like move up in the lab, like you're trying to, you know, make yeah, a be better successful life at that, work and whatnot. But to not make it, to not make any time for your child, that's on you, man. And it's like, it would be one thing if you were pouring everything into work, that would still be something that I would want to talk about. Yeah. But it was like, you're pouring a lot into work. And your social status. And your social status and your personal hobbies. Yeah. And leaving nothing for our son. No, not impressed by that. Because since moving into their home, John had spent thousands and thousands of dollars renovating the place to accommodate his interests and his tastes. And despite a substantial increase in his salary, actually within just one year of private practice, he was making $168,000 annually, Damn. which would be like making $1.5 million today. Holy shit. But the family was struggling with finances, even at that level. Because he was going so because hard. Because he was going so hard on his own shit, not even like pouring it into a little booth yeah. there. But... The most important thing to John in his own eyes was to build a music room in the house where he could retreat. It's like, what are you fucking oh, retreating from? Retreating from what, man? You don't see your kid. You don't see your kid ever. He just wanted to retreat to play or listen to music. And after contracting with Houston-based engineer Louis, or Louis Earth, John told the man, since I was a little boy, it has been my dream to build such a room. Money's no object. The only goal is perfection. Okay. It's like money is an object. You have a fucking family yeah. to provide for and you're spending all it's of an this object, money. Man. Now, years later, uh, Louis recalled his initial conversation with John, noting that the man was not just insistent, but he said he actually seemed possessed. Whoa. Like he was like he was so really, obsessed about this room. Really intense about this. Not only did the music room dig the hills deeper into debt, but it also gave John one more place where he could escape his family, which it, he did not need. Yeah. By the summer of 1968, after years of frustration, Joan demanded that he take a few days off and drive with her to pick up Boot from summer camp, where he'd been uh, for four weeks. He went to like a little, a little program. Yeah. John agreed to take the trip, but neither of them knew that it would be a trip that only further complicated things in their marriage. So here Joan is being like, can you actually show up for once? Yeah. And then the one time this motherfucker does show up, it changes everything. Ooh, what happened? In a bad way. It was at Camp Rio Vista that John first met a woman named Anne Kurth. Don't she even. She was a woman who would tra change his life dramatically. Don't even. Like John and Joan, Anne had visited the camp that weekend to pick up her children. One afternoon, as John was sitting with the other families in the mess hall for lunch... He just leaned over and introduced himself to Miss Anne there and her son, who were seated right by him. And over the course of the weekend, John and Anne just kept bumping into one another at the camp. While Joan was off somewhere, uh, you know, taking care of their fucking child. Oh, come on. And when they returned to Houston a few days later, John called Anne. He was like, hey. Oh, he just had her number? Yeah, he got her number oh, nice. over the course of that uh, 
bonding ooh, time ooh, where he was supposed to be uh, showing up for his son. Ooh, I tell you. He called Dan and he said, oh, I had uh, my film developed, like took a bunch of pictures while we were away this weekend. Do you want to see some of the pictures? Huh. So I, w- I would love to meet up and show you some of the pictures and that's it. Just look at pictures together. Yeah, totally. Not this is fine. All. Everything's totally fine. Yeah. Anne knew that John was married to a society woman, no less. But she figured she would entertain the little fantasy for a little while longer before ultimately shutting it down for the sake of uh, decency and And decorum. come on. Yeah. What the fuck? Both of you. What the fuck? But the problem was she liked the attention. Oh, fuck off. And more than that, she really liked John Hill. Well, he's married. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. The afternoon photo sharing was soon followed by a lunch, then another lunch, And before long, Anne and John were engaged in exactly the kind of relationship that Anne said she had planned to avoid from the start. Please, Anne. Yeah, bitch, please. After a few weeks of clandestine meetings, Mm -hmm. I love the word clandestine. Yeah, it makes it sound so much nicer than it actually is. I know, secret. Asshole meetings. (laughs) Bullshit. Betrayal. Gross meetings. But clandestine, too. It's like, oh, you have time for that. Uh Uh, Not your fucking kid, though. So after a few weeks of those secret meetings, John was upfront with Anne about his intentions. She later recalled, he informed me that from this moment on, I was to consider my time fully taken up by Dr. John Hill. I'm sorry, what? He was like, you're mine. I want you. Marked territory. This is really gross. Agreed. This is really gross. Yeah. Well, and Anne was like, okay, what about your wife? John oh, said. Oh, oh, now you're asking about his wife? Yeah. I love that. Did you hear what my about eye your roll wife? from over here? Oh, what? Huh? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, oh shit. Really about her. Yeah. Let's, let's ask about her now that it's not sounding so great to you. Exactly. Yeah. So when she asked about Joan, John said, you know, their relationship had been over for quite some time and he was, quote, trapped in a marriage he had to get out of. Oh, shut up. It's like, then get out of it and give, yeah. give me a call once that's done. Exactly. Over the years, he said they drifted apart. They were living two separate lives. They had very different interests, different goals. You know, she wanted to raise their kid. He didn't. And by the end of summer, <laughs> though, John and Anne had become lovers. And now he had to figure out how he was going to get out of his marriage. The fact that this man met this woman and this woman met this man at a at summer camp picking summer camp. up their children, yeah, they should be ashamed of themselves. 150 Truly. million percent. Now, one fall day, Joan returned home from a horse show to find a note. I repeat, a note. They'd been married, like, I, I want to say, like, probably 10 years at this point. He saying, did not burger from Sex of the City, Fuck this girl. you! I wrote that in my notes! Did you? I literally, I will show it to oh you. Oh, my God. I literally wrote that in my notes. <laughs> the note that he wrote her said, things, had not been, uh, things have not been good between us. I've gone away for a few days to find myself. I'm sorry, I can't. Don't and then, hate me. This is what I wrote. Obviously infuriated at the equivalent of burgers. I'm sorry, I can't. Yes, no. Yes. I can't. I'm sorry. I, I can't. can't. Don't, Don't hate, hate me. me. I do hate you. I'll post it. Oh my god, I can't same level. That's fucked up. Same level. That is. So obviously fucking enraged, Joan called the surgical practice over and over and over and over again. But her husband never returned her. Any husband of her and calls. the father of her child. Correct. Never returned her calls. Yeah. So that night she went to her parents, which I would be like, Daddy! Yeah, right? You're like, Daddy, I've been wronged. <laughs> oh, let Ash know. Honey, you Ash let go, gonna Daddy, know. for this. Mm-mm. That night she went to her parents. She told them what happened. And Ash's instinct, this man's, this, this man's this is man's. a faja. <laughs> His instinct was to hire a private detective to find all the information he possibly could <laughs> to destroy his son-in-law. And you know what? Let's I, go. I mean, just parent things, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry. If you leave, You are my kid, it's gloves off. You like, are my kid <laughs> and you leave your fucking, my grandson, your son. Boot? I'm sorry. Gloves off. You Boots hurt off. Joan and Boot? Ash isn't letting this go. I would never. No. And neither would Ash Robinson. He's going to get the Coast Guard on it. Like, he's, like, he's just on this. <laughs> Legit. So Joan managed to, you know, de-escalate her dad. But the yeah, next day. I mean, day, it's fun to talk about. <laughs> it's fun to talk about. Oh, so she, de- she de-escalated That's him good. in the moment. But the next day, once she had gotten over the initial shock of uh, abandonment, yeah. she also felt pretty vindictive. And in the two weeks that followed, she told everybody about what her husband had done, how he simply walked out on her and boot. And she was like, 
I hope I fucking tarnish his entire reputation. Yeah, I mean, I'd be, I'm Tom Petty too. Like, yeah. that would be. Bitch, I have Tom Petty tattooed on my body. Yeah, like, fuck that. You're gone. Literally Sorry. done. You walk out on your wife and your child. And then what do the, you expect? the worst part of this, and I feel like you'll agree, the worst part of this to me is finally, after the word had spread all around Houston, John called Joan, finally, oh. and asked if they could meet. Oh. Wouldn't answer any calls before that. But now that he's getting it Now everywhere. that people are talking, yeah. then you want to talk to me. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, mm-hmm, I'm busy. I have yeah. a manicure. Now, with I, this is just hot girl shit. With her it's best just friend waiting shit. just around the corner, Joan and John met at a downtown smart. restaurant. She had her, she had her BFF smart. right there. And they met to discuss their marriage and the future. It did not take more than a few minutes for this conversation uh, to turn into a shouting match. And John just got up and left. Can't take the heat. Can't. So when Joan returned to where her friend was waiting, the two women jumped in their car and followed John. And the woman that they could now see was in his vehicle with him. This is so gross. He brought his mistress to To a meeting to discuss his his marriage. marriage. And was like, wait in the car while I figure this out. This is so icky. I know. It's giving, if you're watching Real Housewives of Miami right now, that's what it's giving. My baby Lisa. This is just really gross. It's horrible. Like, I feel for Joan so hard I here. do, too. Like, this is just really gross. You will feel like, for Joan for the rest of ever. Yeah. Like, I really do. So after a slow motion car chase back to John's office, Joan confronted John and Anne, the woman who was in the car, demanding to know whether they were having an affair. Now, this is where shit gets wild as fuck. To her absolute astonishment, John lied and told his wife, quote, he was having an affair with this woman's husband and that he was being blackmailed. What? Wait, what? He said he was having an affair with her husband? Yeah, which is, was not true. Why didn't he just say I'm having an affair with this woman? I couldn't tell you. That is the strangest lie I have ever heard. I don't know if it was because... Anne was right there like no there's literally like you can try yeah, to find a little string of logic there there's no string it's of like, logic either way you're having an affair mm-hmm. why are you lying about the person you're having an affair with I don't know I th- the only <laughs> I'm just like what I think because back then like being gay was so frowned upon that people thought it was something you could be cured of so maybe he thought he was being like, oh, like, there's something wrong with me and, like, she'll forgive me for this. I don't know about that logic that, on yeah, his part. That logic is ridiculous, that's, but I, that's the only thing that I can see as to why I'm, he I have, would have done that's that. A, I'd be like, what? <laughs> what? Yeah, exactly. What? So Joan was uh, stunned by this news. Yeah. And also found it very hard to believe. And then she became even more suspicious when just a few weeks later, anonymous notes started arriving in the mail telling her her husband was having an affair, but with Anne. Yeah. And that Anne was only one of several women that he'd oh, been cheating God. with. This, th- this guy seems to have all the time. Yeah. Suddenly all his time is just open. Yeah. He's got lots of time. Oh my God. And he's a plastic surgeon. This really is Real Housewives of Miami. This is just, I'm, I love these. Like, yeah, I don't have time to hang out with my child or no, my child at all. But I do have several um, mistresses. But I have a, like a handful of mistresses. Like a, a straight like, up roster. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So by then, he was more or less living in Anne's house and had cut off all communication with Joan. I take back my original John. I know. I was leading you. I was leading you a bit astray. I didn't know any of this. How dare you, John? Yeah. And when I say my opinion of John is like, I'm not sure about him. I'm sure about the fact that he's an asshole. Like, I'm sure about this. Yeah. I'm just not sure about a later part. And we'll get there. Uh, But so by then he he's living in Anne's house. He cuts off all communication with Joan. And in response, Joan was like, I'm going to do my dad's idea. I'm going to hire a private investigator. So she hired a private detective to follow her husband, which is how she learned for real, like 100% solid proof that he and Anne were were having an affair and that he was living with Anne. She didn't even know where he was living because he just left. Damn. And then she finds out that he's living there. are so shameful. How shameful for both of them. And if I was Anne, I'd be like, why the fuck did you say that you were sleeping with my husband? uh, That's why I'm like, Anne, bye. Qua? Now, throughout the fall of uh, 1968, the Hills' marriage had uh, devolved into 
a strange dance of jealous stalking. John's attempts to get, in, or excuse me, Joan's attempts to get incriminating information on her husband. And it's just divorce. Just a whole bunch of nasty. Just divorce. Pretend you don't know each other. I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure this guy doesn't want to know his child anyway. So yeah, just let them go like off it. together and, I'm, you know, it's fine. And it's, this guy sucks. It's something. But instead of just, you know, getting divorced... They drove, or uh, Joan drove around Ann Kurt's neighborhood, started shopping where Ann shopped, followed John regularly in the hopes that she would catch him in the midst of the affair. Damn. By the end of the year, private detectives had confirmed that John had taken his own bachelor apartment, which signaled to Joan that their separation was yeah. definitely permanent. At just 37 years old, she was about to become a divorcee for the third time. Oof. And th- that shame to her. I was like, gonna say, I personally don't think there's any shame in it. No, but I can't imagine at, having to go through that in at this, this time, point in time period in, in the this South. place and dirt and like in high society. All three of those things lying on her. Whammy, I didn't whammy, take that whammy. into account when I first was like, just get divorced. What the fuck? I totally forgot that she's been divorced two other times. Right, and that. In that place and in that time and in that whole society, that one, that would be looked at. One divorce alone would be exactly, looked at. Exactly, but three, I, I can understand why she was a little scared. Exactly. And so she was just going through it at this point. Ugh. I think this is when she she hit, like, breakdown Yeah, time. this sounds awful. Yeah. So she could, I think before she was feeling, like, vindictive and she wanted to get some kind of proof of this and she didn't know what she was going to get when she got there but then all of this just came to a screeching halt and hit her all at once well that's the thing when you get you can get so many little bits and pieces of like quote-unquote proof right but when you get that one that that just hits and really shows you that it's happening it's a different feeling it's a different hit it's a different hit because you can know it without knowing it right and then when you know it it's like oh the way that hits differently is like eek and like you can't for lack of a better way to say it, you can't lie to yourself anymore. No, you can't. Because you once know? you see it right in front of your face, it's like over. Because you, you, I should say you can't convince yourself that it's not true yeah. anymore. Not lie to yourself. Because that's exactly what it, my my ex from like a million years ago. The Fuck same you. <laughs> that asshole. That it was this. You remember? I everybody remembers. <laughs> there were little bits and pieces I would find that I was like, very clearly he's cheating on me. Like yeah. very clearly. But when I got the one, when I when I was able to to call that number and. And, and got girly, that voice on the other pop end. Answered. Who was not a not a man. Yeah. Uh, that he was under Jim, a man's name. Right? Uh I think it was. It was Jim. Yeah. 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 Uh she would th- this person was labeled Jim in his phone and and I just thought Jim spoke a little strange through text message to him. Yeah. And so when I called that number and it was not nope, Jim. It was not Jim. Well, <laughs> the caller on the other line said, My name is not Jim. My name is not Jim. Name and not she Jim. said, Who are you? And I said, oh, girl. Oh. And then me and her became friends. So I know. I kind of love that. You did that. You did the other woman, that Hell movie thing. yeah. <laughs> I love it. No, Joan wasn't quite there yet. No, but, no. This is a very different situation. Yeah. We did not have children together. Yeah, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> and, and you weren't divorced ever at that no, point. No, I was not. Or you still aren't. That's great. No, it's great. It's awesome. I love it. Same. Yeah. Me too. But Joan, unfortunately, not, not had gone there. through it. She had gone through it. So. Yeah. She called John and she pleaded for him to return, Aww. saying that she wanted to work through their differences. Like she she wanted to give this a, a fighting chance, you know? Yeah. But he explained that he was too wrapped up with Anne and <sighs> he couldn't see how he could just walk away. That is from Anne. Devastating. And to be told But you can walk away from the mother of your child. And your child. Like to be told Wow. I can't just walk away from this woman after this man has walked out on you and your baby. That's really disgusting. That's fucked. That's honestly despicable. It is. Now, Joan's doorbell rang one day in November, and she answered it to find a lawyer standing before her with a divorce citation. She was being served papers. The document alleged that despite John's attempts at civility, his wife's behavior had led to irreconcilable differences and that he was seeking to end the marriage. Joan was stunned and enraged. And she showed the citation to her father, who swore he would take care of everything. Now, this is wild. So Ash was like, no, nope, I'm going to take care of this. Like, this is not happening. Oh, yeah. And a few days later, Joan gets a letter from John asking that, quote, she become reconciled with him and forgive his trans- transgressions. The fuck? The letter also noted specific details about his intention to pay back all the money that he had borrowed from Joan's parents 
and explicitly stated, it is distinctly understood that this is not my idea or intention to influence any judicial action now pending. Did Ash have something to do with this? I cannot uh, <laughs> confirm nor deny. Correct. I, cannot, <laughs> okay. I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> Many people believe that Ash did have something to do with it. Okay. I But no one knows Nobody could sure. prove it. Okay. But people thought so. Uh, which is leads me to my next paragraph. Despite being on John's letterhead and bearing his signature, the tone heavily suggested that Ash had <laughs> used whatever influence he had to force John to reconsider ending his relationship with Joan. He was like, allegedly, you're not going to leave my daughter. Allegedly. Yeah. Either way, though, Joan was happy to have avoided this great embarrassment that she thought a third divorce would be. Yeah. And what everybody would have shamed her for. Ugh. And. Everything that happened notwithstanding, she was pleased that John was going to end his relationship with Anne and finally come home. I regret to inform you that her happiness would not last long. Aww. She's no, breaking my heart. Yeah, this is, it's a tragic case. No one knows what 100% did lead John Hill to sign this letter, so obviously, allegedly, prepared by his father-in-law. Allegedly. <laughs> but in doing so, he put himself in an unexpectedly difficult position. He had agreed to return home to Joan, but he had yet to end his relationship with Anne. Oh, my God. John, get it fucking together. Please. Like, get it together. And now Anne is starting to get the feel, or was starting to get the feeling that he was pulling away. And you get it together, too. So, like, Jesus Christ, everybody. Everybody get it together. R the writing is on the wall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, in response, Anne pushed hard on John and those working in his surgical practice for information about his finances and his whereabouts. So now he's just doing the same thing to Anne that he did to Joan? Exactly. Jesus. Exactly. And because she's, like, you know, trying to track him down all the time, the implication was either that she intended to sue him or she was hoping to get him out of his marriage. Yeah. And to make matters worse, Ash Robinson intended to make sure that his son-in-law lived up to his end of whatever bargain the two men had allegedly struck. Allegedly. And allegedly. And while John attempted to manage, uh, manage, I say, quote unquote, two perilous relationships, he was constantly followed, intimidated, and threatened by anonymous men who were allegedly hired by Ash. Allegedly. Allegedly. So there's nothing to confirm nor deny that those men were hired by Ash. Not it's at just this point. Somebody saying it's that just they think that might be what happened. It's Texas high society I was rumor. Say, feels Texas high society. And it's also for sure. like from the 60s. Yeah. Now, whether the whether whether for the sake of everybody's safety or some other reason, John made the decision to move back home with Joan at the end of the year. I hate this. It's a lot. So in the first months of 1969, Joan tried to make several changes and what she saw as self-improvements aimed at keeping John happy. Aww. Like she was just trying to do anything she possibly could to save her marriage. Well, yeah, there's nothing like getting cheated on. Yeah. He, meanwhile, ran himself ragged, splitting his time between life at home, work, and, of course, more clandestine. Alina doesn't like that word, secret gross meetings oh. with Anne. After everything that had happened, Anne was growing tiresome of the affair oh, and started you? demanding that John decide between his wife or her. It's like Christ on a cracker. You know what, John? God damn. And <laughs> is what I said. To add insult to injury, at the same time, John's music room was finally completed with a final price oh, tag of just over a hundred thousand dollars. This music room cost more than their entire house. This one room inside <sighs> of their home was more expensive <laughs> than their entire home. And it's like, what? And it's just for him. So he j he's just getting a, a fun present? Yes. He gets a fun reward after everything? Yes. Okay. And the room was uh, exactly as he, as he envisioned oh, it. Oh, good. And it gave him reason to, a reason to stay home with Joan, but uh, didn't solve the problem because no. now he's just shutting himself in that room. Yeah. He's home, but is he? But is he really there? Now, despite the letter he presented to his wife and whatever attempts at self-improvement Joan was making, there was just too much resentment yeah, and acrimony like what? between the two of them no for way. that marriage to ever survive. Within the first three months of the year, John and Joan spent most of the time shouting at each other or harboring suspicions. Yeah. Like harboring su That's suspicions deep. on Joan's end. Yeah. It's likely that they would have ended up divorced had Joan not come down with what appeared to be a serious case of the flu in early March. Huh. Around the 15th of March, her friends became rather concerned about her health. 
She'd been sleeping a lot more than usual. She didn't really seem to have any energy for even the most basic social functions. According to Joan, she and John got in a fight over dinner the previous evening, and after struggling to fall asleep, he gave her a tranquilizer, which made her exceedingly tired. Joan's two friends became more alarmed the next day when they stopped by to check on her and learned that she had spent all day vomiting, oh. and they became even more in alarmed in the, in the days that followed as her illness had progressed considerably. Now, by March 17th, two days later, Joan was constantly exhausted exper and experiencing regular bouts of vomiting and unfortunately diarrhea as well. Jeez. That afternoon when the maid went to check on her after John had left for work, he's like leaving while his wife is in this condition and they're trying to figure out their marriage. Jesus. The maid found Joan lying on the bedroom floor covered in vomit and feces. <gasps> and that's putting it lightly. Oh my gosh. There were signs around the room that she had tried to make it to the bathroom but was too weak to even get oh there. Oh my God, that breaks my heart. It's horrific. Oh. The next day, Rhea Robinson, Joan's mother, stopped by to visit her daughter. And that's when she learned the How condition that Joan was in. She had no idea. That also breaks my heart because like when you're like you're married mm -hmm. and like that's you're that sick. You're supposed to be married to someone who will take care of you. One hundred. You're and married to a count. fucking doctor. Yeah. And it's like she can't even count on him for that. Like that's really sad. Like the loneliness she must have felt in mm -hmm. that moment. Because I can't imagine. I think that all the time when I get sick. Oh, like how? About like, like single parents. Yeah. And like, what do you do? I'm like, my gosh. Like, it just like tears my soul apart yes, to, to think about it. All alone in that state. Yeah, but to actually have a partner, a quote unquote partner. And to still be and left alone. you can't alone? even count on them to take care of you. Fucked. Like, that's such a bummer. Absolutely fucked. So Rhea was horrified, yeah. absolutely horrified at the state that she found her daughter in and demanded to know why John hadn't called an ambulance. Because like you said, he's a doctor. He's he a doctor. He should know this isn't okay. Yeah, like plastic surgeon or like, yeah, not. like you went through all You're your residency. Doctor. You're a doctor. And she was told by John that he was, quote, making arrangements for Joan to go to Sharpstown Hospital where she would have intensive care and be treated like a queen. I mean, I don't think it's that hard to make arrangements no. here. Call an ambulance. Now, at the time, because obviously she was so distracted by the state that her daughter was in, it didn't occur to Rhea that Sharpstown Hospital was twice as far away as the Texas, Texas Medical Center. Like, she should have just been brought there. And at the time, it also didn't strike her as strange that under the obviously dire circumstances, yeah. John was prioritizing Joan being treated like a queen, but not treating her like one himself. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. And it's like, no, she doesn't need to be treated like a queen. She needs, she to, needs to, be to be treated, treated medically. Period. Like, she just needs to be treated. Yeah. So after some brief argument between Ash and John, the three, Rhea, John, and uh, Ash, managed to get Joan into the car. And, oh and John drove to Sharpsville while Ray attended to Joan in the back seat. Why? This is wild. And it was a much further away hospital than the one that they could have gone to. Joan was admitted to Sharpstown Hospital on March 18th, 1969, for what doctors immediately assumed was a severe case of the flu. But that would be debated upon for years to come. At first, John's tone and that of the doctor he had asked to provide care for his wife was casual, and it hardly fit the situation at hand. It was only when one of the nurses checked Joan's blood pressure that they realized the grave danger she was in. In addition to the vomiting and diarrhea, Joan's blood pressure was perilously low, oh, indicating shit. that, again, she was in real danger. Yeah. Dr. Walter uh, Bertinot, I believe it is, recalled, I dropped everything and went over. I canceled out my whole schedule. Holy shit. Uh, her blood pressure, I don't know a lot about it. I know you will, was six, a 60 over 40. Damn. Yeah. Like she was, she was. He should have seen that. Oh, 100%. As a doctor, he should have seen that something was dire. Amiss. Here. Yeah. Blood, Damn. Blood pressure, 60 over 40. She actually should have been in shock and basically on the verge of death. Holy shit. But the doctor found her sitting up in bed. What the fuck? Based on the symptoms she and John had reported, the doctor assumed that she had contracted some kind of food poisoning or maybe a bacterial infection, which could possibly explain the wide range of symptoms she had described. The attending doctors attempted to get Joan's blood pressure up while they waited on lab results from blood and fecal samples. But within just six hours after being admitted, Joan's kidneys started to fail. 
Oh, no. Now, by 8 p.m. that night, doctors diagnosed her with kidney failure and actually considered moving her to a nearby hospital where she could be put on a dialysis machine. Holy shit. Because he's saying that he made all these arrangements for her to be treated there, but they don't even have a dialysis machine. I was just going to say, it doesn't look like everybody's ready for her. And at that point, Joan was far too fragile to be moved. So instead, they wanted to attempt um, a a peritoneal dialysis inserting a tube into the stomach and forcing a blood purifying solution through her Damn. until she could be stabilized. But the problem was that the physicians wanted John's approval before beginning the procedure and he was nowhere to be found. What? John Hill didn't resurface until nearly 11 PM. And by that point, the surgeons had gone home hoping that they could still perform the life saving procedure in the morning. So he sat by his wife's bedside throughout the night as Joan slipped in and out of consciousness. Oh, this is awful. Sometime in the middle of the night, she yelled out her husband's name and he woke up just in time to see, and this is very uh, graphic, a torrent of blood race up from her innards and splash out of her mouth. Oh. The hemorrhage had been very, very severe. And despite their best efforts to stabilize her, Joan Robinson Hill died in the early morning hours of March 19th, 1969. Holy shit. Like, and they were just about to do a life-saving procedure. What a horrifying death. Beyond. Oh, I feel so awful. Beyond. Ugh. Immediately following her death, John's reaction seemed quote-unquote normal. We talk about this a lot, but it seemed quote-unquote normal. Yeah. For a man who had just lost his wife. He wailed. He sobbed loudly, screaming no over and over yeah. and over. But as hospital staff tried to comfort him, several did find it odd that... Rather than call Joan's parents, John's first reaction was to call his own mother and a friend of his, Dr. Jim Oates, who lived just a few miles away. When Dr. Jim and Dottie Oates arrived at the hospital, they were both shocked to find that nobody had even washed the body yet and that Joan was still covered in blood. So Dottie began washing Joan as carefully as she could while John walked in and out of the room, frequently interrupting her. Now, according to Texas law, anybody who dies in a hospital must be autopsied by the coroner within 24 hours of their death to determine the cause of death before the body is released. Wow. I know. I thought that was great. Yeah. When Dr. Bertinot informed John that the coroner must be called, he acknowledged what the man was saying, but immediately instructed Dr. Oates to call a funeral home and have them come claim Joan's body to prepare for her burial as soon as possible. Um... No. Yeah. I would be like, you better find out what happened to my wife. Like, that would, wouldn't that be your front? You'd be like, what the hell happened? You would think. He thought it was the flu. I'm sorry. That's not, that's, that's what, not you the think flu. that's the flu? That's I'd be like, even flu. if it started as the flu, what the fuck happened? Or a bacterial infection. And it's like, well. But why wouldn't you want to be absolutely sure? Hey, why wouldn't you? Exactly. And if it's law, then let it happen. And you're a doctor. Why would you ever step in between that? And you're a doctor. You know that. That's the thing. You know the law. And it's like, why step in between it if it's only going to give you more information? I don't know. Huh. So the doctor managed to reach the coroner sometime between 4 and 6 a.m. But by then, the body had already been illegally removed from the hospital and taken to the funeral home to be prepared. What? Later, sometime after 7 a.m., the coroner would make his way to the funeral home, intending to do the autopsy there. Yeah. But by the time he arrived, the embalming process had already been completed. Are you shitting me? And the technician at that point was moving on to the cosmetic procedures. What? Now, despite the embalming process already having begun, the coroner stopped the procedure and began his autopsy. What? He took requisite tissue samples and other biological samples. I guess he's just trying at that point to get Well, and I think at that point he's it's like, locked. I don't need my fucking license stripped away well, from me for thing. not doing an autopsy. Like, it's a, you're doing what you can do at this point. And I think that's what it he's was. He's trying to follow the law. Exactly. So he took requisite, uh, requisite, excuse me, tissue samples and other biological samples that could possibly help identify the cause of death. But as far as he could tell from his examination, there was nothing to indicate what caused Joan to decline so quickly. That's the thing. It felt like it was so fast. It was a matter of days. Yeah. He thought it could have been a cause of acute pancreatitis, which could have accounted for a lot of her symptoms, but there were still other symptoms that didn't quite fit. Now, nevertheless, pancreatitis was listed as Joan's cause of death, 
and the funeral was scheduled for March 21st, wow. 1969. But in the days that followed, questions and rumors began circulating among Joan and John's social circles. Hmm. The top two questions on everybody's lips were, how could John, a doctor, not have recognized the signs of pancreatitis? That's what's fucking me up. And two, why hadn't he taken her to the hospital sooner? Exactly. Ash Robinson had his own questions and suspicions. I but am positive of that. Rather than direct them at John, he instead went to the district attorney's office the day of his daughter's funeral. News of Joan's death had been in all the papers, and all of the papers were citing pancreatitis as the case. But Ash explained to the assistant district attorney, I.D. McMaster, that he had reason to believe John was responsible for his daughter's death. Oh, shit. And he cited the following as evidence. He so said, number one, Joan had been perfectly healthy up to that point. Yeah. Number two, she only became ill after eating food and taking, taking medication that was given to her by John. Number three, she was obviously very, very sick in the days leading up to her death, and John didn't take her to a hospital or allow anyone in the house to come see her. That's weird. According to him. Number four, he promised to take her to Sharpstown Hospital because she was going to receive the best care possible there. But when they arrived, the hospital had no ICU available for her, like no no bed available in the ICU. And again, like I just noted earlier, they lacked several of the machines and services that Joan needed. Well, that's the thing. It's like he's saying, like, I made arrangements. You didn't make any arrangements. No, they didn't even have a dialysis machine for her. I mean, that's insane. And now, number five, he said, despite having died within the window of time necessitating an autopsy, her body was whisked whisked away from the hospital to the funeral home before the coroner even arrived. Yeah, that's which wild. I don't even know how they managed to yeah, get away with that. I know. And finally, he said he consulted with several area physicians who claimed many of Joan's symptoms did not sound like symptoms of pancreatitis. I mean, I don't blame Ash for That's his at daughter. least questioning this. I would also question this. Yeah. You're not just going to take this as like, okay, well, I guess that's how she died. Moving on. Like, yeah, anyways. No. And like, it's like in the midst of this crazy divorce. Thing. Like, I'm not saying John did this one way or the other, but if that was my child and I there was question. all of... The circumstances surrounding this strange sudden death absolutely well and it's like it. there it is texas law here that she was supposed to have an autopsy and you broke that and it's like and you went out of your way to make sure she didn't strange that's we that would be weird to me because i'd be like no my first thing as her like parent would be i want to know exactly what happened here yeah tell me everything i want all the details i want to know what happened here and as her husband why would you not and your husband that's the thing as your as her husband you should also feel the exact same way and why don't you you don't because you're estranged and that's and question mark question mark question strange mark to me right yeah so mcmaster the district attorney there listened patiently while ash spoke and while he was speaking, he assumed that the man was still lost in his grief and just needed to get these accusations out of his symptoms. But system, you mean? System. <laughs> and all of his systems. All of them. But with each point, Ash's theory got maybe not stronger, but certainly more plausible to the man. It's interesting at the very least. Yeah. And the assistant DA there knew. Sorry, I said the DA. He's the assistant DA. He knew that when someone as wealthy and powerful as Ash Robinson spoke, he was at the very least to be afforded the courtesy of being taken seriously. So he did. Yeah. But by the end of the conversation, McMaster said, you know what? I'm going to look into this. But that was not enough for Ash Robinson. He insisted that they needed to get somebody to the funeral home that day to stop his daughter's body from being put into the ground beyond reach. He was like, you, I don't know. We're not looking into this. We're doing something about yeah. this. Knowing this would likely be impossible, McMaster nonetheless said he would do his best. So he reached out to Dr. Joseph Yahimchik. I'm doing my best with that pronunciation. I did look it up. Uh, he was the well-respected coroner of Harris County, and McMaster explained everything about the situation to him. At first, Yahimchik couldn't believe what he was hearing. Yeah. How was he supposed to stop a funeral right as it was beginning and demand to re-examine the body? <laughs> oh, like, that's a big ask. But he knew that McMaster wasn't going to ask this if he didn't think it was important. So he made his way down to the funeral home where he started reviewing the evidence and preparing to examine the body as mourners began arriving in the parlor Holy upstairs. Holy shit. This is the, honestly one of the most wild things wild. I've ever heard. As far as he could tell... The entire process from the death to the embalming had been complete and utter chaos. 
This is just a lot. And although many of the tissue samples taken by the coroner were still available, the fluid samples had already been discarded. Not that it would have mattered much because the samples were taken I was after the say, embalming process yeah. had begun, which is likely why they were discarded. Probably. So after talking with the coroner and reviewing the documentation, he decided there was no need to remove the body from the casket or disrupt the funeral. And he said, I think I can make a determination from the notes and the samples that are still available. And like, you got to go on with this funeral. Damn. People are upstairs. Yeah. Like, like he's just trying to talk about pressure. Yeah. Now, while the Harris County coroner reviewed the case, Ash started gathering evidence he believed would prove John guilty of murder. Most significant, he believed, were the reports from the maid and the butler, Effie and Archie Green, a married couple. Oh. Effie. And Effie and Archie. Effie and Archie, cuties. Effie Green explained how she had found Joan on the morning that she was taken to the hospital. Oh, that awful way she found her. Right. And how she had seen John give Joan pills. And she, too, suspected he was responsible for her death. For Joan's death. And she also gave Ash a bottle of pills that she claimed John had given her for her own headaches and told the man that just after John had given her the bottle, Boot told her, Effie, don't take those pills. You'll go to sleep like my mother did and never wake up. Oh, my God. And Boot was little at that point. Oh, Boot. I don't know if he really said that, but that's That's what Effie Effie claims. Yes. Heartbreaking. True or not, that's a heartbreaking sentence. Yes. The evidence was curious, to say the least, but McMaster couldn't get around the fact that, and this is just kind of like his opinion, he was like, if if you guys are so frightened by John Hill and you think he's a murderer, why are you still employed by him? Um, Because he's paying them. Because he's because a rich doctor. That's, I'm like, what? They can't just quit. Like, I, I don't, that, that's kind of, a, that's a silly question. I it's like, it you don't know their situation. You I'm don't glad know you what agreed. that's about. Yeah. Because it's like. Okay. Like, come on. And it's also like, because I'm fucking terrified of him. Well, like, that's the other thing. It's like, I don't, and okay, so I care about Joan and Boot. Right. So I'm, I'm just, just going to leave, leave this house and be like, well, they're, they're pretty scary. So bye. Bye. See like, ya. Good luck, kid. Right. <laughs> it's exactly. Like, and it's also Texas. They weren't going get, to get a job anywhere else. Yeah. If they left John's Yeah, exactly. House, He's like, like high society shit. Exactly. He had, influence. yeah, you got to take that into consideration, with which these he people. didn't. But a week or so later, Dr. Yahimchik presented his report to the district attorney's office, much to the disappointment of Ash Robinson. I know. After conducting his own tests on the tissue samples, the doctor concluded that Joan had not died from pancreatitis, but he said she died from acute focal hepatitis. According to the coroner, the blood test conducted upon Joan's arrival at the hospital ruled out any bacterial infection. And the toxicology report showed no evidence of poison, but it had been taken after embalming, so it was possible that it could have been corrupted. But oh, to man. his best, you know, determination. estimation, determination, she died from acute focal hepatitis. Okay. This will change. The results of the second autopsy were just as crushing for Ash Robinson, who still believed that John was responsible for his daughter's death. So he was not done yet. He's a dad. He's a dad. He assembled a panel of doctors to review the findings, including Grady Hallman, one of John Hill's closest friends, which I was like, interesting that you would put him on the panel. Yeah. The panel. Maybe that's like. Maybe it's to show like that this is somebody who could be biased. Right. But we'll see if he can just look at the information you know, from an unbiased lens as a doctor. Maybe it was pointed. Yeah, maybe it was. So the panel was immediately skeptical of the findings, with one of the physicians saying, I will stake my reputation that she did not have hepatitis. Whoa. In addition to the fact that Joan had none of the telltale signs of hepatitis, like jaundice, they all noted that hepatitis is almost never fatal within the first few days of symptoms. Yeah. So they were like, I don't think so. They were like, this is pretty wild. Now, encouraged by the opinion of his assembled panel, Ash was hell-bent on seeing that John was brought to justice one way or another. And to aid in this pursuit, he hired former district attorney Frank Brisgoe, a man known for meticulous research and an impressive number of wins under his belt. That spring, Brisgoe went to Dr. Yahimchik to pose some hypothetical questions. He wondered, was it possible for somebody to inject another person with hepatitis? Or could someone inject another person with a bacteria that could cause hepatitis? Whoa. Now, Yahimchik acknowledged that when it came to such things, pretty much anything was possible, but those scenarios were highly improbable. Yeah. 
And instead, Yahimchik believed that Joan likely con- uh, contracted the hepatitis from eating shellfish on a recent trip to Mexico City. Oof. Which is possible. Yeah. But then a whole panel of doctors disagreed with Was that. like, no. So it's just, a, honestly, at this point, it's just a bunch of doctors disagreeing Disagreeing, with each other. yeah. Whatever information Briscoe was after, Yahimchik clearly wasn't going to change his opinion on the cause of death. He said she died of hepatitis. Yeah. Like, I believe it. Yeah. I- I'm not saying I believe it. He's saying he He's saying it. that. In late May, another surprising piece of news came the Robinsons' way, though. Just under three months after his wife's death, John married Anne. John Hill and Anne Kurth were married. You've got to be shitting me. Now, it gets worse. Are you fucking kidding me? The news reached Ash by way of a gossip columnist. That's how he found out. And he went straight to Briscoe, who assured Ash that... This turn of events actually could be valuable should the case make its way to a grand jury. That doesn't look good. Doesn't look good. So Briscoe was like, honestly, I'm so sorry that like you're going through this. This is terrible. But like this could be good for our case. Because it's like even if you didn't do anything, dude. Three. What the fuck months? do you think Un- that's going to look like? Under you two? three months. Like, come on, you two. What Jesus. are you doing? Now, in fact, less than a year earlier, John had provided Joan with a document swearing he would give up his mistress and commit to working on the marriage. So the news of this marriage, this new one, not only meant that John had, you know, uh, not given up his relationship with Anne, but it also implied that he never had any intention of reconciling with Joan and potentially could have been seeking another way out of the marriage, which, like I said, is helpful to a potential case. Of course. So with Briscoe's help... Ash took the new information to I.D. McMaster, hoping that the assistant district attorney would reconsider taking the case to a grand jury. And as luck would have it, something about the story had been nagging at McMaster since he was first approached by Ash a few months earlier. And actually, McMaster was suspicious of Dr. Yahimchik's conclusion. Mm -hmm. So he consulted an expert on hepatitis from the Veterans Administration Hospital who informed him that while it would have been possible to inject somebody with hepatitis, it still wouldn't have killed Joan so That's quickly. what's so wild. And this person said that if Joan had died from hepatitis, someone would have noticed the signs of the illness far sooner and treatment would have been possible. Yeah. And this expert who had said all of this was clear that not having examined the body himself, he couldn't make any determination about the cause of death. But based on what McMaster had told him, it did not sound like Joan died from hepatitis. Damn. So for McMaster, who had big political ambitions and sensed a big opportunity in the case, the news of John's marriage to Anne and this conversation that he had with this expert strengthened the case against Hill. The assistant district attorney started building his case against John Hill for the murder of his wife. Holy shit. And that is where we are going to break for part one because I feel like I just threw so much information at you. Oh, poor Joan. This is like, Joan Joan just breaks my heart. Like, because it's like, fuck. Yeah. And it's like that, what a horrible, horrible death. And to have it turn into such chaos afterwards when she was already going through chaos in her life and like poor Boot. And yeah, just like poor Ash, poor all of these just people. So many people involved. Like, geez, were, it's, this it's, is really it's sad. a tragic case. And in part two, it only gets crazier. Part I don't know two, how. I think, is actually longer than part one. Wow. So you know, uh, I'm not going to tell you what to expect at all from part two because this story is about to take a fucking turn. Okay. So with that being said, we hope that you keep listening, and we hope you keep it weird. weird. But not so weird that you do mean things to your wife yeah don't cheat on people don't cheat on people don't let them be sick and not do anything about it just be a good person 